And now I invite practitioner, board member, Mrs. Jennifer Livingston to bring to you a powerful, thought-provoking message this morning. So take out your pen and paper, open up your hearts and consciousness, and be prepared for a most scintillating experience. Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, good morning, friends. Um, let me add my own words of welcome to all of you, and very especially to those of you joining us also on the World Wide Web. And I'd also like to thank Sandy for setting the tone for this morning's service, and also to our young adults, Janice, Janice, I'm sorry, for sharing the inspirational reading. As always, it is truly a joy for me to share with you from this podium on a Sunday morning in whatever capacity I'm assigned to fill. So as you have all been hearing, we are in the month of May, as we know, in which we celebrate Child's Month, Mother's Day and Labor Day. And of course, we have been asked to come in and support the Ministry of Environment tomorrow. So do make some time to come and be here with us in that activity. But as we're closing out Child's Month, I would like to start off by sharing with you a story from a contest judged by Dr. Leo Buscaglia, also known as Dr. Love. He was an American author, motivational speaker, and professor in the Department of Special Education at the University of Southern California. And the purpose of the contest was to find the most caring child. And while he shared the top five entries, it is the fifth place story that I would like to bring to your attention this morning, which reads as follows. An eyewitness account from New York City on a cold day in December. Some years ago, a little boy about 10 years old was standing before a shoe store on the roadway, barefooted, peering through the window and shivering with cold. A lady approached the young boy and said, my, but you are in such deep thought staring in that window. I was asking God to give me a pair of shoes, was the boy's reply. The lady took him by the hand, went into the store, and asked the clerk to get half dozen pairs of socks for the boy. She then asked if he could give her a basin of water and a towel. He quickly brought them to her. She took the little fellow to the back part of the store and removing her gloves, knelt down, washed his little feet and dried them with the towel. By this time, the clerk had returned with the socks. Placing a pair upon the boy's feet, she purchased him a pair of shoes. She tied up the remaining pairs of socks and gave them to him. She patted him on the head and said, no doubt you will be more comfortable now. As she turned to go, the astonished little child caught her by the hand and looking up into her face with tears in his eyes, asked her, are you God's wife? <laughs> My friends, it is in this knowing that if we too have faith like a little child, we will receive the good that we are seeking. And as such, I have titled this talk this morning, Why Not Choose Faith Over Fear? Dr. Ernest Holmes, our founder of this teaching called The Science of Mind, in his book, Can We Talk to God, states, and I quote, if we wish to prove there is a spiritual principle which we may definitely use, let us forego any sense of coercion and become as a little child in receptivity. Let us definitely and consciously accept our good and continue accepting until we experience it." End quote. In the same vein of exercising childlike faith, the master teacher Jesus states in Matthew 18 and verse three, from the English Standard Version, 
Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. End of that reading. In the Dictionary of New Thought Terms, also by Dr. Holmes, it states that the kingdom of heaven, when likened to a child, refers to the consciousness of simplicity, trust, and confidence with which one should accept that the kingdom of good is at hand. Friends, how many times have you found yourself facing a situation where you have a desire to do something new? Perhaps to start a new business, maybe take a trip to some distant place, or make a decision that may completely change your direction, such as leaving a long-term relationship or a job that you have long since outgrown. And for somehow, you know it like the back of your hand, so the fear of stepping out keeps you stuck in this position. As you hear the warning bells going off in your head, what if I take the wrong step? What if things don't work out? What if, what if, what if? Sounds familiar? Well, Reverend Christine Green, former assistant minister of New Thought CSL in Oregon, and who now serves on the interim ministry team, as you hear Sandy talking about our process of selecting a new minister, well, there are ministers who operate in that capacity if you don't have someone to hold the podium while the minister leaves, and she functions as one of those persons. So writing in the January 2022 Science of Mind magazine, Guide for Spiritual Living, she likens this questioning of ourselves as the inner critic spreading doubt and fear in the middle of the night. Reverend Christine goes on to state, that doubt is debilitating, disempowering, and diminishing. Doubt makes us afraid to take a step forward with the irrational fear of what could happen, end quote. While Marion Williamson, you may know her, she's New York number one times best-selling author, in one of her quotes, she states that, in fear, we forget who we really are. Forgetting who we are, we forget who lives within us. And in forgetting who lives within us, we lose conscious connection to our power." End quote. In choosing faith over fear, this is an individual process of growth, patience, and willingness. However, many of us come to faith as a last resort. <laughs> Oftentimes, we'll try everything in our conscious power to make things happen. And when all else fails, we'll have no alternative but to trust. But for some of us, faith comes as a result of a dramatic experience, while for others, mm -hmm. it develops gradually. But it doesn't matter how we come to exercise this faith. As practitioners of this teaching, which we all are, as we study the science of mind, we know that there is a universal law which receives the direct impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. This energy can only respond by correspondence. What this means is that the measure of our faith in the infinite good is the measure of our capacity to draw from it. Let me repeat that. The measure of our faith in the infinite good is the measure of our capacity to draw from it. This is why the master teacher Jesus said, and I quote, it is done unto you as you believe. It is according to our faith that life demonstrates through us. Friends, we are all very familiar with that biblical passage in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, which states, now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm sure you know that one. Well, this biblical reference in, the, in this passage is often quoted as a description of what faith is. But faith has been recognized as a power throughout the ages, whether it is faith in God, faith in oneself, and in one's fellow man, 
And as outlined in this entire chapter of Hebrews 11, it speaks to the idea of faith being embodied by many of the persons written about in the Old Testament, such as Noah and Abram, for example, Isaac, Joseph, Sarah, and Moses. So it therefore indicates that the idea and acceptance of faith existed even before the teachings of Jesus, the master teacher. In the Science of Mind textbook, page 156, Dr. Ernest Holmes further expounds on this passage by stating, the thought of faith molds the undifferentiated substance and brings into manifestation the thing which was fashioned in the mind. This is how faith brings our desires to pass, end quote. We are fully aware that this substance is all around us, equally and evenly present and available to all. The degree to which we manifest our desires is dependent on our belief and acceptance of the good. Caroline Reynolds, in her book, Spiritual Fitness, How to Live in Truth and Trust, a course we had previously offered here at the temple some time ago, states, it's on this issue of all pervasiveness, many people stop short. Having dipped their toes into the deep waters of faith, they will trust enough to allow an angel to find them a parking space. Yet when it comes to the more serious issues of finances or career, for example, they will prefer to take the matter into their own hands." End quote. She then references the book, A Course in Miracles, which tells us that we cannot serve two masters. You can't have a bit of faith for the smaller things in life, such as demonstrating a parking space, for example but none for the bigger ones. Faith is an absolute, and as such, it demands your complete belief in and obedience to a higher power. If you use faith in some, area, some areas of your life and fear-based reasoning in others, you will actually negate the effects of your faith throughout. Friends, a good-natured flexibility with oneself and a faith persisting in the face of anything which would contradict it is the only way to approach our life and affairs. Yet, as we continue to examine this matter of choosing faith over fear within our own human experience, we find that there is no one way to describe it. Often it is based on our feelings of hopefulness or hopelessness. We can easily demonstrate our most fervent desires when we are feeling positive, optimistic, and full of joy. At these times, our faith can sustain us, and it is enough to see us through. But on the other hand, when we are feeling less than hopeful and we cannot see our way, at these times, our faith is diluted. And it is precisely at those times, however, when we feel less than hopeful, that we are reminded of the words of Jesus, the master teacher, as he states in Matthew 17, verse 20. The New International Version says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. This brings me to a story from that famous author, Unknown, the title of which is Faith Can Move Mountains. A small congregation in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains, USA, built a new church on a piece of land left to them by a church member in his will. Ten days before the new church was to open, the local building inspector informed the vicar that the parking lot was inadequate for the size of the building. Until the church doubled the size of the parking lot, they would not be able to use the new sanctuary. Unfortunately, the church with its undersized parking lot had used every inch of their land except for the mountain against which it had been built. In order to build more parking spaces, they would have to move the mountain out of the backyard. Undaunted, the pastor announced the next Sunday morning 
that he would meet that evening with all members who had mountain moving faith. They would hold a prayer session asking God to remove the mountain from the backyard and to somehow provide enough money to have it paved and painted before the scheduled opening dedication service the following week. At the appointed time, 24 of the congregation's 300 members assembled for prayer. They prayed for nearly three hours. At 10 o'clock, the pastor said the final amen. We'll open next Sunday as scheduled, he assured everyone. God has never let us down before, and I believe we, and I believe he will be faithful this time too. The next morning, as he was working in his study, there came a loud knock at his door. When he called, come in, a rough looking construction foreman appeared, removing his hard hat as he entered. Excuse me, Reverend, I am from Acme Construction Company over in the next county. We are building a new shopping mall over there and we need some filled dirt. Would you be willing to sell us a chunk of that mountain behind the church? <laughs> we will pay you for the dirt we remove and pave the exposed area free of charge, if we can have it right away. We can't do anything else until we get the dirt in and allow it to settle properly. The little church was dedicated the next Sunday as originally planned and there were far more members with mountain moving faith on opening Sunday than there had been the previous week. <laughs> uh, my friends, while we might not at this time be seeking to move physical mountains, we must be patient with ourselves as we encounter our challenges and strive to live in this greater experience of oneness with God oneness with our good, and oneness with each other. As such, we need to take the time to develop our faith through our continued spiritual practices of affirmative prayer and meditation, and through the use of affirmation, which we can call upon in times of need. Let me share with you two such affirmations. I'll read them once, and we, I'll have you repeat after me. And the first is, no matter the challenges I may encounter, I know I can remain in faith. So let me break it down. No matter the challenges I may encounter, I know I can remain in faith. And the second is, I have complete confidence. I do not waver or falter in my faith for I know that which I desire is already received. So I'll break it down. I have complete confidence. I have complete confidence. I do not waver or falter in my faith. I do not waver or falter in my faith. For I know that which I desire is already received. And if that is so, and so it is. <laughs> As we have looked at the nature and function of faith, let us also explore the ideas shared further by Reverend Christine Green in the January 2020 Science of Mind magazine guide for spiritual living as to what are the steps for building our faith. And she shares that there are three steps. The first is hope. Hope is a sense of doubtful expectation. We hope something good will happen to us, but underneath, doubts and fears linger. These doubts and fears produce a type of anxiety called waiting. As we release the doubt and fears, we move to the next step, which is trust. We begin to develop trust. We have a deeper conviction in the creative process of life and develop greater patience. The stress of waiting is replaced by patience and a sense of calmness that all is well. Then the final step is gratitude. We give thanks that the demonstration is already done. The good is already received. 
Gratitude is the expansiveness of faith. When your faith, my friends, blooms into your manifested reality, you will feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude and connection with the universal life force. And you will know, as author James Allen states in his book, From Poverty to Power, to follow under all circumstances the highest promptings within you, to be always true to the divine self, to rely upon the inward light, the inward voice, and to pursue your purpose with a fearless, restful heart. This is faith and the living of faith." End quote. My friends, in closing, I leave you with a final quote from Reverend Christine Green, which states, faith is the freedom in knowing that whatever I need will be provided, whether it is having the strength to face the day, the courage to speak my truth, or offering help to a loved one. Faith is appreciating every day as a treasure and every experience as a gift." End quote. Let us choose faith over fear. There is no need for doubt in your consciousness or in your experience of life. You have the faith to live fully and freely and with joy. Namaste. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Let us give her another round of applause. We have been urged to choose faith over fear. And we know that, that faith, having faith will help us to quell our inner critic and keep our mind away from fear. We, we know that faith supports us and spirit knows no big nor, no, big nor small. So we need to become um, faith uh, mountain movers. I love that, con um, that, that image. We, are, we become mountain movers. And she gave a really, really wonderful affirmation, which I like. I have complete confidence I do not waver or falter. I do not waver or falter. Um, for I know that that which I desire is already received. So that, that is a faith. You just know, ask and it shall be given unto you. And she reminded us to hope, to trust, and to be grateful. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Jennifer.